Thanks for joining us today at Synthesis Workshop. I'm your host, Alicia, and for today's Research Spotlight episode, we're joined by my friend and lab mate, Brandon Miller. Brandon received his Bachelor's of Science in Chemistry from the University of New Haven, where he did research under the supervision of Pierre Torillo. Brandon is currently a PhD candidate in the Managed Lab at Northeastern University. And with that, I'll hand it over to Brandon. Welcome, and thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Alicia, for that kind introduction, and thank you to Matthew and the entire Synthesis Workshop team for inviting me on for a Research Spotlight episode. Today, I'll be discussing with you the total synthesis of Streptothrin F, on which our group published in 2022 in Chemical Science. Before I begin with the content of this presentation, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the synthesis team. Matt is a graduate of the Manage Lab, whose thesis work ultimately culminated in our total synthesis of Streptothrin F. Minte is a current graduate student in the lab who focuses elsewhere on kinetic target guided synthesis, however, early on focused on the synthesis of the beta lysine fragment of Streptothrin F. Yulia is a current graduate student in the lab. She is my mentee and she will carry on the work on Streptothrin F once I have moved on. Additionally, we have undergraduates Andrew and Hannah to thank for support of these studies. Without further delay, let's talk Streptothrin F. Streptothrin F is a member of the Norseothrysin mixture of Streptothrin analogs. These seven analogs differ from one another in their beta lysine homopolymer subunit length, seen here in blue. As a brief overview of the history of Norseothrysin, in 1942, this mixture was first isolated and its activity was profiled. Around 30 years later, in the 1970s, the Norseothrysin mixture was characterized for its individual Streptothrysin components, and in 1981, the first Streptothrysin F total synthesis was published. Our primary interest in Streptothrysin F and the Streptothrysin backbone is in the antimicrobial activity of this class of molecules. The Streptothrysins have gram-positive and gram-negative activity. They are active against CDC and WHO flagged resistant threats. They are active against members of the escape pathogens, as well as many key multi-drug resistant pathogens. Of note, Streptothrysin F is the least toxic of the entire Streptothrysin class. Over 60 Streptothrysins are known to the literature, many of which are naturally occurring. However, a large subset are semi-synthetic acyl or alkyl derivatives of the primary amines on the beta lysine subunit. For those interested in the biology of Streptothrysin F, I would like to point you to our recent PLOS bio paper from our collaborative research effort focusing on the Streptothrysin F bactericidal effect as well as the mechanism of action of Streptothrysin F. When looking at Streptothrysin F, there are two logical disconnections about the glucosamine sugar core that can break this molecule up into three fundamentally distinct moieties. These are the glucosamine sugar core, the streptolidine lactam, and the beta lysine homopolymer. When viewing these fragments through the lens of a synthetic organic chemist, we come out with a protected glucosamine core, a streptolidine isothiocyanate, and a protected beta lysine as our three late stage fragments. Retrosynthetically, we arrive at Streptothrysin F through a Lewis acid catalyzed guanidine closure of this thiourea, followed by global stepwise deprotection. Ultimately, we arrive at our thiourea through stepwise fragment couplings of the glucosamine to the beta lysine fragment followed by the streptolidine isothiocyanate fragment. Our isothiocyanate can be generated through protection manipulations of our CBZ protected lactam, followed by a stereoselective azidation and a tandem staudinger azavitic thioisocyanation. Formation of the CBZ lactam relied on nitromethylation of our preceding aspartic acid, followed by a formic acid promoted deprotective lactamization cascade. The beta lysine fragment arises from a stepwise reduction oxidation sequence on our protected amino nitrile, which we arrive at through a reductive mesylation and subsequent cyanation of the starting amino pentanoic acid. Transitioning to the scaffold of our longest linear sequence, we anticipated that access to the functionalized glucosamine was possible through a nucleophilic ring opening of the corresponding beta sulfamidate which in turn was generated through a dihydroxylation sulfamidation sequence on our gulal sugar core. 
Access to the Gulao sugar core relied on deacylation and an epoxidation inversion of two key hydroxyl groups, ultimately transitioning our glucal starting material into our Gulao intermediate. And with this, we have painted our retrosynthetic picture of Streptotherson F in its entirety. In the forward direction towards our streptolidine isothiocyanate, we began with our protected aspartic acid. Upon treatment with carbonyl diamidazole, the activated anhydride reacted smoothly with a solution of excess nitromethane and stoichiometric terpidoxide to form the nitroketone. Diastereoselective reduction was then carried out under Felconon conditions followed by nitro reduction through in situ nickel boride generation. In the same pot, the addition of Bach anhydride gave our protected amino alcohol. Without Bach protection in this instance, we simply couldn't rescue our product from the aqueous layer upon quench and extraction. Warming of this product in formic acid deprotected the previously installed Bach group and promoted lactamization. However, in our hands, a small amount of inseparable formulated lactam was always generated and therefore the addition of sodium carbonate and methanol was necessary in order to cleave this byproduct. Finally, it is at this stage that our diastereomeric mixture formed from the previous keto reduction can be purified on silica. At this point, I'd like to take a moment to spotlight two of the more visually interesting procedures in this streptolidine synthesis. First, visually interesting by accessory, the nitromethylation reaction requires all reactants and reagents to be prepared in solution. And therefore, when you run two crops of this reaction in parallel, it's hard to not notice that it seems like you're throwing quite the party in your hood. Next up, one of my favorite reactions to run in the sense that it's not simply shades of colorless, yellow, orange, or brown, is the nitro reduction through nickel boride generation. This reaction changes from the bright green color of nickel chloride to the intense black color of nickel boride upon slow addition of sodium borohydride accompanied by the rapid generation of hydrogen gas. Now, back to business. With our diastereomerically pure lactam in hand, silylation with TBS triflate followed by hydrogenation and subsequent Bach protection produced our bisbach lactam. It was key in this instance to swap the CBZ group for Bach groups to allow for orthogonality of protecting groups once our fragments are coupled together. Treatment of this bisbach lactam with KHMDS and trisyl azide provided our alpha acetolactam as a single diastereomer. It is now that I'd like to take a moment to discuss the selectivity of our azide transfer protocol. We believe that the complete selectivity of this reaction is likely directed through the synergistic effects of a congested top face of our enolate and the bulky nature of trisyl azide. A moderate yield in this case was observed as a consequence of enolate formation and substrate stability. Our resulting alpha acetolactam could then be directly transformed into the isothiocyanate in the presence of triphenylphosphine and excess carbon disulfide. This reaction, dubbed the staudinger azovitig reaction, is believed to proceed through this transient phosphoazide, which upon interaction with carbon disulfide forms a six-member transition state that results in the expulsion of nitrogen gas, triphenylphosphine sulfide, and our isothiocyanate product. Transitioning to the beta-lysine fragment, we start with a CBZ-protected L-ornithine. Treatment of this with carbonyl diamidazole followed by sodium borohydride gave us the corresponding alcohol which was used directly in the following mesylation. The resulting mesylate is then displaced with potassium cyanide, dibol reduction then gives us the aldehyde, and the pinic oxidation brings that aldehyde up to a carboxylic acid. And over five steps, we arrive at our protected beta lysine. The synthesis of our glucosamine sugar core begins with the cheap and abundant per acylated glucal starting material. The first milestone of this synthesis is the stereo inversion of our 3 and 4 positions in order to convert the glucal sugar into a gulao sugar. There are few scalable methods reported on this type of transformation and we chose the stepwise protection deprotection inversion method reported by the Crotti lab out of the University of Pisa. So, kicking things off. Treatment of the per acylated sugar with methoxide liberated our alcohols for the regioselective benzylation at the 6 position through the use of Taylor's catalyst. TBS protection at the 3 position followed by mesylation at the 4 position and subsequent desilylation of that previously installed TBS group gave us our inversion ready glucal. 
Exposing our inversion precursor to potassium terbutoxide affords the following in situ epoxide. Upon treatment of this epoxide with a solution of freshly prepared in situ tetrabutylammonium trimethylsilanolate, which is in turn obtained over two steps from hexamethyl disilane, we observe regioselective epoxide opening at the three position. Upon aqueous workup, the TMS group falls off to afford us our benzyl gulal inversion product. As a quick review, over six steps and 31% yield, we have converted the starting glucal sugar into the gulal sugar. With our gulal sugar in hand, TBS protection was performed with high regioselectivity, followed by the installation of the DMB protected carbon oil group. Dihydroxylation through the Upjohn method then prepared us for the installation of our key 1-2 diamino functionality. To do this, we employed Burgess reagent chemistry pioneered by Nicolau and coworkers. In this protocol, an alloc modified version of the Burgess reagent is added to our dihydroxylated sugar in order to produce a beta sulfamidate. Mechanistically, the formation of the beta sulfamidate proceeds stepwise, beginning with the addition of two equivalents of the Burgess reagent. Hydroxyl displacement on the Burgess triethylamino salt results in the formation of a disulfamate intermediate. This reaction occurs at THF reflux temperatures, which allows for the thermodynamically disfavored ring flip to occur. This ring flip orients the disulfamate into its reactive conformation. Finally, displacement at the anomeric position can occur through an SN2 pathway or an SN1 pathway. The result of both SN1 and SN2 addition pathways gives the desired beta sulfamidate. Coupling constant analysis of the sulfamidate confirms stereochemistry and reveals to us the 4C1 ring conformation of this sugar. This chemistry not only installs the necessary amine at the anomeric position, but affixes a good leaving group onto the two position of our sugar. Treatment with sodium azide displaces the ring oxygen of our sulfamidate and the addition of sulfuric acid cleaves the resulting sulfamate from our alloc protected amine. This azide is then reduced under Staudinger conditions to give us the late stage glucosamine sugar core intermediate. Before we get into the chemistry of our end game, I want to remind you all of our three fragments. The protected glucosamine, the streptolidine isothiocyanate, and the protected beta lysine. Our convergent end game begins with an EDCI coupling of our protected glucosamine and our protected beta lysine. Subsequent alloc deprotection of the resulting lysyl glucosamine through the mild palladium catalyzed allyl transfer protocol liberates our anomeric amine for coupling to the streptolidine isothiocyanate while avoiding anomerization. This free amine is then coupled to the streptolidine isothiocyanate in a reagent free manner to give our resulting thiourea. And for anyone wondering, this thiourea intermediate comes in at a whopping 1,472 Daltons and a total of 108 protons. Bach deprotection with TFA followed by a mercury chloride mediated desulfurization guanidation closes our guanidine and it is at this point that we have finished making any new bonds and all that is left are deprotections. As advertised, desilylation with TBAF followed by hydrogenolysis gave us the acetate salt of streptothrin F, which was converted to the sulfate salt via sulfuric acid precipitation for more straightforward biological testing comparisons with the isolated streptothrin F sulfate. In summary, we achieved the synthesis of streptothrin F with the longest linear sequence of 19 steps, 35 total steps, and a 0.40% overall yield. And with that, I would like to thank all the members of the Managed Laboratory, specifically Roman and Matt, for their mentorship throughout the years. Additionally, all of the members of the Shriptotherson team. I would also like to thank the Kirby Lab, our microbiology collaborators out of Harvard and Beth Israel Deakness Medical Center, and the U Lab, our structural biology collaborators out of Case Western Reserve University, and of course, our funding agencies. With that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention, and I hope you enjoyed this Synthesis Workshop Research Spotlight episode. Thank you to Brandon for the spotlight on the synthesis of Streptothrin F. If you would like to learn more about this chemistry, please visit Brandon's recent publication in Chemical Science. If you'd like to learn more about the biology of this natural product, please visit the group's publication in PLOS Biology. If you've enjoyed this episode and would like to support our podcast, please consider subscribing to us here on YouTube or following us on Twitter. 
Thanks again, and we hope to see you next time.